Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Today I would like to provide an introduction to my upcoming series on Alexander's successors. During that series, I'm going to be looking at the lives and wars of the various Diadochi. However, in this video, what I really want to do is just to lay a groundwork for understanding that series and explain what I'm trying to do. In addition, I'm going to provide some general historical context so you'll have a broad outline of what happened. And then when you watch the individual videos in the series, you'll be able to contextualize them properly and more fully appreciate the importance of each individual that we'll be discussing. So without any further ado, let's jump right in and answer all of your pressing questions before you type them onto the comment section. So since I'm about to totally shift the focus of my channel for over a month, I figured that quite a few people would have some concerns and that there are certain questions that I can anticipate ahead of time. So I'm going to try to do exactly that right now. First of all, why cover the topic of the successors? Well, one, it's criminally neglected. There are surprisingly few books being written about it, and there aren't very many YouTube videos on the subject either. So I figured that this really fills a gap, especially here on YouTube. Not only that, but the Wars of the Successors are the real life Game of Thrones. In many ways, the people in the Wars of the Successors were actually more ruthless than the characters of George R. R. Martin. And if you don't believe me, just watch some of the videos that I'm about to drop in the coming month plus. One thing that I'd like to get right out of the way is that my method for making this series was a little bit hodgepodge. Um, several years back, there were two books that came out on this topic, one by Robin Waterfield, one by James Rom. And I started writing biographical entries about some of the successors. And I was going to sort of publish them on this blog site that I was partaking in at the time, but I ended up not finishing it because I was really busy. So I still had those files from five years ago and um, I found them recently and I decided to finish them up. So some of the scripts that I'll be reading in the upcoming videos are things that I wrote five years ago and there is some disconnect, a very small amount between those videos and the ones that I've written more recently. There also are a lot of little details about who's married to who and uh, the precise chronology of some events and personal interactions. And I definitely have said a few contradictory things in the course of this series. So I'll just let you know ahead of time, uh, there are details that are off. So if you think something seems off, you're probably not wrong. What are my sources for the Wars of the Successors? That's a question that seems to pop up a lot in almost every video. The only major surviving source that has any degree of detail is Dodder Siculus. And if you know anything about Dodder Siculus, you know that he tends to be a bit inaccurate when compared to other historians and he was highly derivative. He more or less copy pasted from existing sources. There are some fragments here and there from other people like Durris but for the most part, um, there aren't very many good or consistent sources for this topic. A lot of the memoirs of Alexander's successors focused on Alexander's actual campaigns and have only survived in fragments. So those aren't all that useful. There also are three lives of Plutarch that I've used pretty heavily, but mostly I've relied very heavily on the work of modern scholars like the aforementioned Waterfield and Rom. I wish I had known a little earlier about a couple of other works that have come out in recent years. There's one by John D. Granger, but I was not aware of it at, when I started making this series. And actually, I only learned about it tonight as I was uh, looking up images to put into this uh, presentation. Um, so another thing I imagine people will ask me is, is this the new sole focus of the channel? The answer is only until New Year's Eve. At that time, once I have completed the series and covered all of the successors, I will then shift back to normal operations with my Romans of Renown, Byzantine Emperors, and all the other series that I do. So yes, the series will run for about five weeks. So those are the questions that I anticipate. And hopefully those of you watching this video can help me spread the answers to those questions. So let's move on.
So one of the things you have to decide when you're doing a historical project of this nature is exactly what scope to use chronologically. And I think the natural focus is to look at the years from 323 when Alexander dies down to the year 281 when the last of the successors who had actually ridden with Alexander were dead. However, I don't think that's exactly where the story begins or ends. That's just the high point of the story. So because of that, there will be times where I will mention people and events from as early as 360 and as late as about 240. Um, there are some people that I list in the series as successors who never met Alexander. Some of them barely even knew the successors themselves. However, their contributions were vital to setting up the Hellenistic world that emerged from all of this, so I figured why not include them. And we'll also see that there are some people who were actually dead before Alexander was even king who were also still relevant to the issues of succession that emerged after Alexander died. And the idea overall is to cover the men and women who were chiefly responsible for dividing up Alexander's empire and to look at their exploits and the long-term impact of their activities. And the only way to do that is to not be strictly chronologically bound by an arbitrary decision to only focus on the most relevant years. Each day at 10 o'clock a.m. from November 25th until December 31st, I will be releasing a video on a major figure from the Wars of the Successors. I've organized this entire series chronologically based on when the individual I'm covering happened to die. So there will be some people who are significantly older than others who will not go first in the series. Antipater, for instance, was a very old man when all of this started, yet he is not the first person we're going to cover because he was not the first to die. As Cersei once said, in the Game of Thrones, you either win or you die. And make no mistake about it, the struggle for Alexander's empire was a Game of Thrones, and you either won or you died, or in some cases, you both won and still died. But we'll get to that when we get there. I'm also going to be throwing in some supplemental videos here and there to cover people who didn't quite make the cut as 10 a.m. material, but are still interesting enough, and we still have enough information about them, which is also a factor, to make a video. And if you're wondering how this cut was determined, it was a strictly subjective thing in some instances. Neoptolemus and Alcides might not have been worthy of this, yet they made it. Whereas the successors of Cassander did not make it, even though you could possibly make a case for including them at the 10 a.m. slotting. But again, it was subjective. And as I mentioned earlier, I would never claim that this series is anything like perfect, although I do think that it is high quality, all things considered. Another thing that I anticipate getting questions about is how I chose to spell the names of the various successors. And I used a system that was quite different from my normal practice in my Byzantine Emperor series, where I typically just use the Latinized form because it's the most familiar. So here, what I was originally going to do is just go full bore Greek. But then I realized that that might not be a great idea since many of you would recognize the Latinized form of a name, but not the Greek-ish form of the name, the transliterated version. So what I decided to do is go for a mixed system where if a name came out in Greek where it still was recognizable, I went with it. And one example is Craterus, because all we're doing is changing out the C for the K and then the U for the Omicron. And the difference is something that a lot of people are familiar with. A lot of people understand that there is no letter C in the Greek language and that when things end in U-S in Latin, they tend to end in O-S in Greek. So I figure that is not a heavy lift for pretty much anyone who has read any degree of ancient history. However, for some other names, it would just be a little awkward or it would simply just not be familiar. So I opted to stick with the familiar spelling Antipater rather than to go with Antipatros 
Another example is that with Seleucus, I chose to keep his name with a C because his empire is called the Seleucid Empire, and I am one of those people who cannot use a K as a soft C. That is something that short circuits my brain. I can't do it. I refuse to do it. I would rather die than do it. So it will be Seleucus with a C, even though it definitely would still make sense with a K. Deal with it. Again, some little things like this I just have to do in a subjective way and hope for the best and move on. And now that we have all of that preliminary stuff out of the way, let's get into the history proper. And to really tell the tale of the successors properly, we have to look at all of the factors that get, went into the way that they fought each other and the way that they thought. And to do that, we have to look at Macedonian history. And I'm not going to do a thorough examination of all of Macedonian history, but I will just give you a brief overview of what happened before Philip II. So Macedon had had great potential since the 5th century. And even around 400, it was on the verge of blossoming into a major power, but it remained underdeveloped. Macedon was pretty rural. There weren't a lot of cities. Um, they also had great timber reserves and gold mines. But while they were able to harness a lot of that timber, they were more or less selling it to the Athenians so the Athenians could make their fleet. Um, and even though they produced capable rulers out of the Argead house several times, these rulers were held back by political instability. They could never quite trust their aristocrats to not revolt, and there were always brothers, cousins, nephews, uncles, and others who were willing and able to win over the support of some of the troops and to fight for the throne. Another thing that exacerbated this existing problem was that outside groups like the Athenians could back a usurper if the king of Macedon became unfriendly when it came to the trade deal over the timber. So the Athenians would go in, give a bunch of money to one of the cousins of the king, and then you have a civil war, and either the new king wins and he's a friend of Athens, or the old king has to make a concession, so that way the Athenians or whoever is intervening will stop. So obviously this holds back Macedon pretty effectively. The other factor is that Macedonian kings were always warrior kings, and they always led their troops from the front. And this meant that they had a high mortality rate, and this was especially true when they fought enemies like the Thracians and the Illyrians. And to make things even worse when it came to political instability, almost all instances where a king died resulted in civil wars over succession among his sons or brothers or whoever happened to be in a position to make a bid for the throne. Civil war in Macedon was the rule, not the exception. And it's an old scholarly formulation from probably about the 19 teens, but it's one that really hasn't been overturned. And that is the description of the Macedonian system as an absolute monarchy tempered by assassination. All the evidence we have shows that the army assembly had authority but that authority seems to have been only what they could threaten to do. So their ability to cause violence was really the full extent of their political rights, as we would understand it. There also were some important institutions that were in place before Philip II came to the throne. The Institute of the Royal Pages, for instance, seems to have already been instituted around the year 400 or so. And that, of course, is something that caused kings to be raised in a cohort with Macedonian aristocrats at a court school, which would teach you all the things you would need to know to rule and govern. And we'll see that Alexander came up with a cadre of men who were close in age to him, and a lot of these guys would go on to become the major successors. Um, well, they knew everything Alexander knew, so why not? Anyway, let's move on to Philip II because even though he had been dead for about 13 years before Alexander died, uh, he was still pretty relevant in 323. So in 359, Philip II's older brother had died in battle, and Philip had been named regent for his infant nephew, 
However, Philip convinced the Macedonian army that what they needed was an adult king who could win battles for them now. So in 359, Philip II deposed his nephew, and he came to power in his own right, and he quickly began reforming Macedon from the ground up. Philip had spent quite a bit of time living in Thebes as a political hostage, and he had studied the art of war under the Theban generals who were the best of their day back when he was a teenager. So Philip had developed all kinds of ideas about combined arms, and he also was the guy who introduced the pike phalanx, so those really long spears that the Macedonians used. That all came about because of Philip, and he seems to have implemented these reforms very early on in his reign. And what he manages to achieve is that he fulfills all that potential that had always been there, but had never been there because they hadn't had a strong enough ruler who was able to avoid assassin's blades and really establish himself. Philip brings about political stability. There are relatively few coups and revolts and all that kind of stuff during his tenure. He also begins to urbanize Macedon to a greater extent. So this will help him to organize and control his population, marshal resources, and all of that kind of stuff. He also does quite a bit to develop his mining operations, so now he has more gold than anyone else in Europe. And he also exploits the forest of Macedon for his own ends. So rather than just being a kind of proxy of either Athens, Sparta, or some other major power in Greece, Philip harnesses this timber and uses it as he sees fit and then sells it to whoever he wants to sell it to. And that's a major shift. Philip, above all else, was a great diplomat, and he might have been one of the very best diplomats in all of history. He makes alliances with all of the people who could potentially harm Macedon, and one of his favorite methods for doing that was to take many wives. So this means that he has a lot of daughters and a couple sons, one of whom was Alexander, uh, one was an infant boy, and one was a developmentally disabled man named Aridias. And how does this relate to Alexander's time? Well, uh, many of Philip's children were still alive, and they held legitimacy by virtue of being the child of Philip II. Another thing to note is that many men of the older generation, and many of them were still around in 323, thought that Philip II was actually greater than his son Alexander. They would say that while Alexander had conquered a great empire, it was Philip who had really laid the foundation. He had created the army that conquered that empire. He had you know, reformed uh, the state from the ground up. And there was a real debate throughout all of antiquity, and students were assigned to write essays on the subject of whether Philip or Alexander was the greater ruler. At any rate, though, um, as I mentioned, many of Philip's contemporaries were still around, and they still had ambitions in 323. So what they had learned from Philip about how to use marriage alliances will come into play, and we'll see that especially with Philip's former lieutenant Antipater, who happened to also have a countless number of daughters. While the shadow of Philip II is surprisingly prominent in the Wars of the Successors, the man who really looms the largest at all times is always Alexander the Great, and for obvious reasons. Alexander III of Macedon was the man who conquered the Persian Empire, and he was planning even more campaigns at the time of his death. He had not ironed out all of the details of how the empire was to be run, although people who say that he had taken no thought for it are massively exaggerating, and they're overlooking all of the times where he replaced governors and ordered native troops to be raised and all of that kind of stuff. However, he did seem to have a general vision that he was slowly working out, and that vision seems to have been sharing governmental responsibilities with Persian elites. So if we look at the way the Persians ran their empire, they dealt in the Medes, who were a closely related people from Iran, who were technically not Persian, though. So Alexander's plan was not only to work in some Greeks in his administration, but also some Persians. So have a fairly broad ruling class, a relatively broad pool from which to recruit talent. However, uh, we'll see that his successors have a much narrower vision than what Alexander had. During his reign from 336 to 323, 
Alexander also empowered the men that he grew up with to hold the highest offices in the empire. So while there were some older guys who'd been around in the time of Philip II, and many of them will go on to be impactful, a lot of the guys who will start out as the major successors are actually only in their early to mid-30s. And yet, they're still the ranking members of the Macedonian state in terms of their seniority. And the reason for that is that they were friends with Alexander, and he had promoted them. Alexander's shadow will loom so large on the horizon that what a lot of the successors will do is to actively imitate Alexander in even the most minute ways. So one successor, Leonidas, will actually master the head tilt that Alexander was famous for. So that way when people saw him tilting his head, they would think, hey, that's like what Alexander does. And in their art, they make themselves look like Alexander. Many of them will make hunting scenes for propaganda where it's uh, Alexander and them out hunting a boar or something. So they never quite ever got away from Alexander either. either. Even hundreds of years later, when the distant the descendants of the successors were still ruling some of these Hellenistic kingdoms, they would still employ Alexander in their art and propaganda because ultimately he was still this part of their creation story. So yeah, Alexander is a factor that we can never discount and we'll see that he's pretty much comes up in some capacity in every single video in this entire series. One group of men who played a big role, especially in the early days of the successor wars, were the veterans of Alexander's campaigns. Macedonian soldiers felt like they were entitled to choose their kings, or at least to put a check on them in some way, maybe kill them if they were incapable of leading properly. And Alexander's veterans were certainly not an exception to that long-standing Macedonian trend. If anything, because they had conquered the world and many of them were on the borderline of being rich by the time that these wars had ended, they felt even more empowered and entitled to really speak their minds. In army assemblies, the veterans of Alexander would use their military might to demand certain things from their officers, and their passions were easily aroused. Famously, they mutinied twice, even under Alexander, demanding to go home, and uh, they were still pretty discontent when Alexander died. Many of them uh, changed their goals and tried to get settled in the newly conquered areas, but all of them still wanted to make sure that they got their piece of the pie and that they were paid the bonuses they were promised before the successors went and blew all the money fighting frivolous civil wars or doing other things that would not benefit them. The other feature of these veterans is that they were deeply loyal to both Philip and Alexander and all members of the Argia dynasty. So what we'll see is that many of these soldiers will have a great deal of faith, even in Aridias, Philip II's son, who suffered from developmental disabilities, to the point that they demand that he becomes king. Now, one thing you have to say about these soldiers is that unlike their commanders, these guys are not conniving or backstabbing, but they are every bit as ruthless as the men who lead them. And they would not and did not hesitate to resort to things like kidnapping, murder, and betrayal in order to get their way when it was needed. And we'll see that play out several times. So these are men who should always be taken into account, even though they are a little bit anonymous because of the way that they're only ever presented in these grand assemblies as a kind of mob. But that's really unfair because, again, these are the men who conquered the world by their own spears. Prior to Philip II, Macedon had suffered many civil wars. However, all of those civil wars were fought with Argeid princes at the head of each side, or at least as the puppet of one side. And that would remain true even after Alexander's death. The reigns of Philip and Alexander did not change the basic dynamics of Macedonian succession. When Alexander died at the age of 32 to 33, he did not have an adult male in line to replace him. He had no full brothers or even half-brothers who were adults or competent, uh, 
and he also did not have any children who were of age. He did have a couple of kids, but he only started having kids when he was around 30 or so, which means that they were nowhere near being ready to rule an empire. He had a son named Heracles, but he was only about two, and his mother was a Persian princess. However, she and Alexander were not married, so he was not an, a legitimate option. Alexander also had impregnated his wife, the Bactrian princess Roxanne, but the child was as yet unborn, and of course no one knew whether the child would be a boy or not. The other option was Alexander's developmentally disabled half-brother Aridias, who was living at Babylon. Um, Alexander had had other relatives who might have been viable picks, but he had eliminated them upon coming to power because he did not want to be challenged for his throne, as so many of his predecessors had been. So, for instance, he had an uncle who was only about five or six years older than him, who had actually ruled as an infant under Philip, but when Alexander came to power, pretty much his first move was to kill Amentas IV. So, had Amentas IV been alive, and, you know, from what we can tell, he would have probably just lived peacefully in retirement the whole time, while Alexander was off conquering the world, he could have then been tapped to be the new king, while Alexander's heirs were growing up. But of course it didn't happen because you know he had been dead for 13 years. Um, so of the people who would be royals who were in direct line, uh, they weren't very capable of ruling. However, there were other Argeids who had the blood of Philip II or had other links to the dynasty, and they were eager for power, and in some cases they were actually capable of exercising it. Alexander's mother, Olympias, was still alive and well, and she was still uh, looking for power in Macedon. Alexander had two sisters, one of whom was a full sister, and both of them also wanted to get in on the game because they had been raised by Philip II, and they had their father's flair for wanting to engage in politics. He also had a niece who was extremely ambitious and was something of a warrior princess. All of these people will be covered in videos, so don't worry if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, because you will in the coming days. Suffice it to say for now, though, that the Argeids are the only true source of legitimacy in the Macedonian world. So this is why it will take a really long time for the successors to actually try to openly rule in their own name, and they will always claim to be acting on behalf of the joint kings Philip III and Alexander IV. So since there was no fully functional adult male Argeid who was the son of either Philip or Alexander, there was no one worthy of holding the entire empire together. So power would effectively fall to Alexander's generals who would govern in the name of Alexander's son, Alexander IV, who was only born weeks after Alexander's own death. Despite the political achievements of Philip and Alexander, the Macedonian aristocrats were just as bloodthirsty, power-hungry, and ambitious as their grandfathers who had fed all of those civil wars throughout all of Macedon's history. Alexander had killed a lot of disloyal men, and all the men who were at Babylon were pretty loyal to him. However, without Alexander, there was no one there to serve as a focus of loyalty. And without Alexander's presence, all of these guys felt like they were good enough to rule in their own right. Many of these men had fought by Alexander's side. They'd been educated alongside him. Some of them had been serving before he had. Um, all of these people felt like they were fully entitled. They all thought that they were the descendants of people from the Iliad, and they all thought that the gods favored them. So it didn't take long for this veneer of the generals working together in the name of Alexander IV to break down and for Alexander the Great to become simply a symbol of legitimation that had nothing to do with um, the reality of them actually trying to uh, preserve his empire. These generals would quickly start fighting each other, and they would start picking apart the empire that they had helped Alexander to create in the process. In 323, Alexander was in Babylon preparing for an invasion of the Arabian Peninsula. So he had the majority of his army assembled there, he had a fleet, and he also had most of his senior 
generals and officials, including all of his bodyguards. And bodyguard doesn't necessarily mean a literal bodyguard like a Secret Service member. It's more of an honorary title for a high-ranking general. So anyway, all of the major players are present, and then Alexander dies. And Alexander's last act is to hand his signet ring over to one of his generals named Perdiccas, who was basically the guy running the administration of the Empire, as well as being a major general. And because of that symbolic gesture, Perdiccas now had an even greater degree of authority, and he presided over the army assembly. And what ends up happening here is that the soldiers proclaim a joint kingship for Philip III, formerly known as Aridaeus, and Roxanne's unborn child, who became Alexander IV. Perdiccas also had to account for the fact that there were two major figures who weren't there, namely Craterus, who had a large army he was taking back to Europe to discharge the veterans, and Antipater, who had been regent in Macedon during the entirety of Alexander's invasion. So this was already a settlement where you had two major figures missing, and it was probably going to have a few issues just because of that. However, um, Perdiccas's plan was to dispatch the major figures to the various commands around the empire, and this was actually a plan proposed by Ptolemy, who started this division as early as possible. But anyway, Perdiccas's spin on that was to try to strike a balance between keeping people happy and also keeping them in check, because as the senior regent, his goal was to make sure that he was always the preeminent person. So he would try to give people just enough to keep them happy, but not give them any opportunities to gain extra prestige that would threaten his own position. At the same time, while this is going on, one of the reasons why Antipater is not really able to participate is because as soon as the news of Alexander the Great's death arrives in Greece, Athens revolted and built up a big Greek coalition, invaded Thessaly, and they nearly succeeded in killing Antipater. But they did also end up killing one of the major successors who, uh, you know, never really got a chance to do anything. But all of that we'll talk about in more detail when we talk about Leonidas and Craterus. In 322, just one year after the settlement at Babylon, the uneasy peace between Perdiccas and the other generals broke down. There were a number of reasons why this was the case. Perdiccas managed to alienate quite a few people. Ptolemy was ambitious, and Antipater did not trust Perdiccas because he thought that Perdiccas was going to marry Alexander's sister. So all of those factors caused Antipater and Ptolemy to form an alliance against Perdiccas, and this led to a two-front war. And Perdiccas dispatched some of his generals to fight in Asia Minor, while he himself led his army down to Egypt to deal with Ptolemy. But the Nile was actually a very defensible defensive line, and uh, Perdiccas was unable to cross. He tried a couple times, lost a bunch of men, and his men were not in the mood to tolerate any BS, so they decided to execute Perdiccas and end the war. Ptolemy and the other victorious allies then declared Perdiccas's remaining followers as outlaws when one of Perdiccas's Greek followers managed to win a victory against Craterus and kill him in battle. And that is basically the end of the First War of the Successors, and now they all decide to travel to a common point and make a new settlement to replace the settlement at Babylon. In 321, Antipater entered into Asia and joined the victorious coalition at a place called Triparadisus, somewhere in Syria. A paradise for the Persians was a place which was like this hunting preserve for the kings, and Triparadisus is apparently an area where there were three of these joined together, so it was the Disney world for Persian aristocrats, basically. Anyway, um, these guys joined together, and they decided to hash out a new settlement, with Antipater presiding. However, um, there was considerable turmoil involving an Argead princess offering bonuses to angry veterans, there was a mutiny, and Antipater was nearly murdered. However, order was restored, and Antipater was then able to create a new settlement, which centered around himself. But everybody trusted and more or less admired Antipater, and he started to marry off his daughters to create a network uh, 
so that way there were enough interconnections among the successors that they could work together. And this wasn't a bad plan. Antipater had been at Philip's side when Philip had done something like this to gain control of the Greek world. However, Antipater was really old, and uh, he died in 319, and this basically causes this new settlement to come unglued. So civil wars continue. Actually, there had still been fighting between the victorious coalition and the surviving generals of Perdiccas, like Eumenes. So this had not been a fully successful peace, but uh, it had been better than what had come before and what would come after. But again, this is one case where there was actually a good idea from Antipater, but he was unable to carry out that idea simply because he was too old. The Second War of the Successors dates to 319 to 315, and while the title Second War of the Successors might lead you to believe that this was a conflict with an internal coherency, the fact is that these were two almost completely unrelated wars going on simultaneously in geographically very different parts of the empire. In Europe, Antipater's deputy Polyperchon had been named as his heir to both Macedon and the guardianship of the two kings, and Cassander, Antipater's oldest son, was named as Polyperchon's deputy. Cassander was not happy with this arrangement, and he thought that he had been built, so he decided to revolt. This led to a civil war in Macedon itself. Cassander eventually will win control of Macedon, but Polyperchon was able to escape to Greece and rule the Macedonian possessions there. And one result of this war is that Queen Olympias was killed, and the Greek world, of course, was now divided, and Macedon uh, did not control everything directly under one regent. In Asia, Antigonus the One-Eyed, who had been empowered as the general of Asia to put down the remaining Perdicans, finally succeeded in defeating Eumenes, although he had to go all the way to the eastern side of the empire to do it. And this left Antigonus as the most powerful man in the empire. He had not been a huge player early on, but now he has the biggest army in the empire and he controls the most territory. So at this point, he is looking a lot like a target because if he's allowed to accumulate any more power, he'll be able to take over the entirety of Alexander's empire. So the new dynamic for the time being will be to stop Antigonus. The Third War of the Successors is a unified conflict, and I think that one way to look at it which might make it clearer would just be to call it the Antigonid War, since at this point it became clear to everyone that the path to their own survival or success would only come by defeating Antigonus. So what we see is an everyone versus Antigonus war. Ptolemy in Egypt, Seleucus who was in Babylon, but got driven out by Antigonus, and Cassander in Macedon, all fought against Antigonus, who controlled basically all of Asia. Antigonus was able to fend off the attacks from Cassander into Asia Minor. He traded blows with Ptolemy in the Near East, and then he had to deal with Seleucus entering into Babylon, starting a revolt and resuming his office. The war ended when Ptolemy and Cassander basically sold Seleucus down the river. They made a peace which did not include him, so they were able to make some gains and to strike a blow at Antigonus while um, Seleucus was still fighting for his life deep in Antigonus's territories. So this war is officially over, yet this world is not at peace because Seleucus and Antigonus are still slugging it out and their war has a name too. The war between Antigonus and Seleucus was called the Babylonian War, and the dynamic of this war is that Antigonus the One-Eyed was trying to regain control of Babylon, drive Seleucus out, and restore what he had held prior to the Second War of the Successors. So for two years he tries in vain to conquer Seleucus, but he's not able to do it. Unfortunately, despite the fact that this involves two of the greatest successors and two of the men who were the absolute best generals of this era, we have no details from this war at all. The reasons for this are twofold. One, it happened in the East, so Greek authors were less interested in it, and two, 
whatever text there was on this in Diodorus was lost. Um, as many of you know with ancient sources, they often have big gaps in them, and this happens to be one of them. If I could choose to recover information on just one event in ancient history, it would actually be this little segment of the Babylonian War. At least we're talking about history of events. At any rate, um, we do know the result, and in the end, Antigonus had to cede Babylonia, Elam, and Media to Seleucus. So basically, at this point, Seleucus is the ruler of the east, whereas Antigonus is really the ruler of the center of the empire, and his focus is on the west anyway, so it enables him to keep fighting against who he sees as his real enemies, Ptolemy and uh, Cassander. So I imagine for Antigonus, the thought process is, yeah, I'll take care of the guys to the west and come back for Seleucus later. Seleucus, in the meantime, decides that his former allies had sold him down the river once, and he had let them take the brunt of Antigonus's force for now. While he focused on the east, he fought a war with Chandragupta Maurya, um, and he uh, also got some war elephants out of it. Um, he did cede some territory, so at this point, Alexander's empire is no longer 100% intact because Seleucus just gave away some of that territory to Chandragupta Maurya. Back in Macedon, uh, Cassander decided to have Alexander IV executed in 309 because that year Alexander IV would have turned 14, which was the legal age of manhood in Macedonian society. And therefore, he would have posed a threat to Cassander's exercise of independent power. And with Alexander IV gone, there was no longer any need for anyone in the Hellenistic world to really pretend that they were fighting on behalf of the Argeids, since all of the major players uh, and all of the major heirs were now dead. There was only a gap of one winter between the Babylonian War concluding and the Fourth War of the Successors breaking out in earnest. Antigonus took on the combination of Cassander and Ptolemy, and they began fighting in 308. Antigonus was still able to mount the offensive despite the fact that he had lost the Babylonian War, and he sent his son into Greece in 307 and Demetrius would really become famous around this time, even though he had already been well known. This is when he really uh, skyrockets to become Demetrius the Besieger. At any rate, the Antigonids won a major naval battle at the Battle of Salamis in 306, and at that time Antigonus and Demetrius decided to name themselves as kings, and they were then followed by the others who couldn't be left out of that trend. They all wanted to be king anyway, so why not just pull out the crown, stick it on your head, and smile for the people. Cassander in this war was only saved by Lysimachus, who came out of Thrace. He had been keeping quiet up to this point because he had been tied down at home, but he comes in and prevents Macedon from falling to the Antigonids, and then they are able to mount a joint invasion of Asia Minor, so they put uh, Antigonus on the defensive. But then um, Antigonus gets his main field army together, and they corner the combination of Cassander and Lysimachus at a place called Ipsus. And they're on the verge of crushing the anti-Antigonid alliance when Seleucus and his army arrive on the scene, and now the battle is joined in full. And at the Battle of Ipsus, what we see is that the elderly Antigonus dies, and his empire is thrown into disarray. And now the new top dog will be without a doubt Seleucus, um, who now controls pretty much all of Asia and more or less holds everything that Antigonus held before the Second War of the Successors, minus some things in the very far east. After the Battle of Ipsus, the pace of events slowed down quite a bit. Um, this is because a lot of the successors are getting older. There are fewer of them remaining and the battle lines are really starting to be drawn and people are starting to kind of accept the idea that maybe no one will unify Alexander's empire. At, in 297, Cassander, who had always been somewhat sickly, died of an illness and this threw Macedon in the chaos because none of his successors were able to really set up a successful kingship. And this meant that from 297 to 285, there was about a 12-year civil war in Macedon involving Pyrrhus of Epirus, Lysimachus, the last of the Antipatrids, and some other people too.
By 285, Lysimachus emerged victorious, and now he controlled the entire European part of Alexander's old empire, and also some stuff in Asia Minor. In Egypt, in the meanwhile, while all this was going on, um, Ptolemy I actually retired from being king, and he t abdicated for his young son Ptolemy II. So the Ptolemies by this point had more or less accepted that they were going to be the rulers of Egypt and the lands that were in the best interest of Egypt to hold, and that was good enough. But there was still there were still a couple of people who were not content with that idea and still wanted the entirety of the empire. By 281, there were only two original successors left, Lysimachus and Seleucus, both of whom were about 80 years old by this point, and both of whom were looking to finish this conquest before they died. So they decided to square off in a decisive battle at a place called Choripedium, and what ends up happening is that Seleucus wins overwhelmingly, and he gains all of Macedon in a swoop. All he had to do at that point was to occupy the rest of Macedon and Greece and then invade Egypt, overthrow Ptolemy II, and the whole thing was his, and then he could pass it on to his son Antiochus. So everything was neatly wrapped in a bow, but then Seleucus decided to ride on a scouting mission with one of Ptolemy II's disgruntled brothers who had not gotten the throne, and that brother decided to murder Seleucus and then seize the throne of Macedon for himself. And then uh, some other turmoil follows when some Gauls invade Greece and kill this king, Ptolemy Caranus. Anyway, um, the Plain of Plenty, which is what Corpendium uh, literally translates as, turned out to be a plain of woe, as these two old men were not able to fulfill their lifelong ambition, and it was somewhat all in vain if their goal had been to unite all of the empire under one banner. In 281, the Wars of the Successors proper ended. However, there was still quite a bit of work to be done by the Sons of the Successors to really consolidate the Hellenistic kingdoms as they stood later. In Egypt, Ptolemy II was able to continue his father's work, and he developed Egypt into a stable kingdom. Seleucus' son Antiochus I was able to pick up the pieces after his father was murdered, and he was able to hold on to most of the empire, and to set up the most powerful Hellenistic kingdom, the Seleucid Empire. Antigonus II Gennadus was able to reclaim Macedon for his family after a whole lot of adventures and setbacks, most of which were the fault of his father Demetrius the Besieger. And there were also some local dynasts who were able to set up new states in Bithynia and Pergamon, despite the fact that neither of these dynasts were Macedonian. They were still, in many ways, the heirs of Alexander, because they showed that sense of enterprise, risk-taking, and the other things that really uh, made the successors stand out. These guys also had those traits, even if they never went with Alexander to the ends of the earth. Before I let you go, I would just like to make one additional note on the nature of the Hellenistic world. So that way you can see the relationship between the successors and the world that came after them. So as I mentioned, Alexander's vision seems to have been to incorporate the Persians into the ruling elite, so that way you have a broader elite and more flexibility and inclusion. However, the successors were more eager to secure their own power, and they weren't necessarily looking to create something that would be a great vehicle of future conquest. So their vision for the Spear One land in Asia was to Hellenize that land as much as possible by importing a bunch of Greek and Macedonian settlers. So many Greeks left mainland Greece and moved into these new empires, especially the Seleucid Empire, and they set up cities that were just Greek cities away from home. What ends up happening is that the locals quickly catch on that the only people who have power in this world are Greeks. So they begin to adopt Greek culture and the Greek language uh, in an attempt to get themselves involved in government, and for many of them this works. In fact, this process of Hellenization is effective enough that this is the time period during which the Phoenicians really start to lose their identity, and by the time of the Roman Republic, when it reaches the Eastern Mediterranean, 
Phoenicia is more or less culturally indistinguishable from Greece. Uh, but at the same time, in most places, local traditions and hierarchies also remained intact, even while some people were Hellenizing. A good example of this is in Jerusalem, where there were people who did Hellenize, but at the same time, most people remained Jewish in their faith rather than adopting more Greek religions. So uh, that was one way that this dynamic would play out. Another product of this time, which helped to facilitate uh, co uh, communication between Greeks and non-Greeks, was the development of Koine Greek, which then became the lingua franca of the Eastern Mediterranean. And basically what Koine is, is they took Attic Greek, the Athenian style of speaking, and they really watered it down and simplified it so that way it would be easier for non-native speakers to use. And Koine Greek was also easy to pick up as a writing language, and that is why the New Testament is written in Koine Greek. Macedonian officials could also move around from kingdom to kingdom and take up post in one kingdom then move to another. So for instance, uh, if you were a finance minister under the Seleucids, you could move to Egypt and probably get a job doing the same thing. And this is pretty unique. This is very different than what had come before, where you were limited to service in the kingdom that you were born into, or serving as a mercenary. But in this case, it's totally different. It's a different dynamic, where these kingdoms all coexist, and the understanding is that the elites who run them are basically the same, and that they are more or less interchangeable with the elites from the other empires, because they're the same people, who are descended from the same tradition. So it's a unique atmosphere that we see on the international stage among the successor kingdoms. Back in Greece, the major development is that the age of the polis is over. No longer will men primarily identify with their home city, and no longer will a single polis like Athens or Sparta be powerful enough to take on a kingdom. So now, to compete, the Greeks will have to copy Macedonian military tactics and organize themselves into leagues, like the Achaean League and the Aetolian League, and only then will they be able to mount any kind of a challenge to the rulers of Macedon. But anyway, I don't want to get too far off topic, but I think that looking at this helps you see that there's very much a two-way relationship between what the successors wanted and then the pre-existing conditions which help to shape the decisions of the successors and help to determine their ultimate success or failure. Anyway, that's enough of an introduction. I think that I've rambled on for long enough. I'm Thersites the Historian. If you'd like to support this project and my other work, I suggest that you go over to Patreon and contribute. You can find the link to my Patreon in the description of this or any other video. So until tomorrow morning, I will see you around.